Hey guys, we are back with video number three. If this is my third video of mine that you are watching, you are out of order. Go back, try to figure out the correct order. The videos are properly labeled, all right? Okay, so let's pick up with Hallwork projections because we've seen them now, but like how do we draw them and how do they relate to Fisher projections, okay? So why we use Hallwork projections is they represent that these things are cyclic and this actually makes it look like a ring. This does not look like a ring, right? So you wouldn't necessarily think that this is a ring structure when in fact it is. This is a better representation, but you need to know how this relates to this. And if you remember before, we said that if something is the alpha enamer, then the oxygen and hydroxide are on the same side. And now you see here that this hydroxide is pointed down. So what does that mean? That means that everything you see in a Fischer projection that's on the right side of this carbon backbone, that's on the same side as the oxygen, all of those are pointed down. So hydroxide, hydroxide, hydrogen, hydroxide. Hydroxide, hydroxide, hydrogen, hydroxide. Okay. And then everything that's on the left side is going to be pointed up. So hydrogen, hydrogen, hydroxide, hydrogen, hydrogen. Hydrogen, hydrogen, hydroxide, hydrogen, hydrogen, right? Okay, so you see this different sort of point of view, okay? So everything on the right is going to be pointed down. Everything on the left is going to be pointed up. And then how we compare this to the alpha and beta configurations is we talked before about how if it's an alpha configuration, then it's going to be, let me go back, if it's an alpha configuration, it's going to be on the, the right side, the same side as the oxygen, or pointed down, right? If it's a beta configuration, it's going to be on opposite sides as the oxygen, so it will be pointed up. And so all you really have to do is you have to look at your projection and then determine how is this hydroxide pointed. So in this case, it's pointed up. In this case, it's also pointed up. Since they're both pointed up, these are both B. Okay, these are both going to be beta. Now, these rules would be flipped if we were talking about L sugars, but again, what did we say before? <clears throat> Sorry. We said that L sugars are not near as common as D sugars, so don't worry about L sugars. Yes, the rules would be changed, but we're focusing on D sugars right now. Okay, so for D sugars, if this hydroxide is on the bottom, then it's going to be an alpha anomer. If it's on the top, as in both of these cases, these are going to be beta anomers. And what this is showing you is that primarily glucose forms the pyranose form, but glucose can actually form a furanose form as well, and it's just the hydroxide from the fourth carbon attacks instead of the hydroxide from the fifth carbon. So you can get some really cool stuff that happens with these sugars whenever they go from the linear form to the cyclic form, they kind of get some options as to sort of what pathways and what they really want to do here. All right, but let's be honest. These ring structures, these ring structures are not flat, okay? They are not flat. Um, it has to do with the sterics, with all the stuff that's happening there, and these bond angles, they're unrealistic. They can't adopt a truly planar structure which means in reality, these six-membered rings are not going to be flat. They're either going to take what we call a chair conformation, where one side of the ring is pointed up and the other side of the ring is pointed down. So it actually looks like a person sitting in the chair with their little feetsies and their head up here, right? Or they're both pointed in the same direction. So we don't call it this way, but you could kind of think of the chair is kind of like a trans conformation and the boat is kind of like a cis conformation. But here we have both sides pointed up. So this would be more like a hammock, right? More like what a hammock would look like. So in reality, these are the two types of conformations that you would see. I'm not going to ask you to draw and share or boat conformations because, again, I did not require you to take organic chemistry before this class. In a real biochemistry class in college, you would be using this more. But again, this is not technically true biochemistry because all the prereqs were not required. Okay, all right, so let's talk about how we can take these monosaccharides and we can get some different derivatives, all right? So we can come up with some really cool stuff. So there are 
these are a whole bunch of different derivatives that we can sort of derive. Uh -huh. um, we got sugar acids, sugar alcohols, deoxy sugars, sugar esters, amino sugars, and acetyls, ketals, and uh, glycosides. All right. So we're going to look at each one of these and talk about sort of what these derivatives of simple sugars look like and what they can do. Okay. All right. So let's start with sugar acids. So sugar acids, basically what we're going to do is we're going to have this reducing sugar. Okay. And this reducing sugar has a free anomeric carbon associated with it. And then we're going to use some oxidizing agents like hydrogen peroxide or some metals, some positively charged metals to oxidize it in water. And then this is essentially a redox reaction. Okay, so the going from a sugar to a sugar acid, this is a redox reaction taking place, which means really what's moving around are the electrons, right? The electrons are moving around. And here we have our sugar acid. So why are we calling it a sugar acid? Because instead of a hydrogen, now it's an OH group. So this has now become a carboxylic acid group. Okay, so this is a sugar acid. So these this redox reaction is converting this sugar to a sugar acid. And then um, you can, in this example, right, we ended up creating copper oxide as a precipitate, okay? And you can do other sort of side reactions with this, right? So um, you could add copper sulfate. That's what they're saying is that copper sulfate was added, but remember this is an ionic compound, so it's gonna dissociate. So really that's where the copper ions are coming from, right? Added it to the sugar, we get our reddish precipitate, and then we're converting our aldose, which is our sugar, into aldonic acid, okay? So it's just saying in words what the picture is saying below. Um, so let's talk about why you should care about sugar acids. You got anybody in your family with diabetes? Okay, uh, probably so. I know I do. I got several uncles who have diabetes, and it's something that you know I have to concern about as well because there are some sort of genetic relationships to diabetes. Um, but diabetes, it's a condition that causes really high level of glucose in the urine and blood, right? So glucose is a reducing sugar. So how they actually diagnose if you have too much sugar in your blood is they actually turn your sugars into sugar acids and then test for the sugar acids. That's the easiest way to determine the presence of sugar is to turn it into a sugar acid and then test for the presence of the sugar acid. Um, so again, like I said, if you know someone who has diabetes, we have someone has taken advantage of the conversion between sugars to sugar acids to test if they actually have too much sugar. All right, what's another example? We got sugar alcohols, which are aldotols, okay? And how we get these is we reduce again. So this is another reduction reaction. And we can either reduce with um, sodium tetraboride or just some other reagents with um, at the car carbonyl groups of the aldose and ketoses, right? So the etol that we've added to the name is going to be added to the parent name of the sugar. So glucose would be glutatol, mannose would be mannitol, Xylo, xylo xylose would be xylitol, okay? And these things are very sweet tasting. So let's try to figure out if we can see the difference between glucatol and glucose. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna jump back to where we can see the sugar or see what glucose looks like before, okay? So I do believe this is glucose. All right. So if we look at glucose here, you've got your three hydroxides on the right, one on the left, and that's it, right? It's a hydroxide or a hydrogen. Now, let's go back. 
to what we got here with the sugar alcohols. It's the same sort of thing, but what's the real difference happening here? It's not happening in the backbone. It's happening up here, all right? So again, let's go back and let's look. So normal glucose only has the CH2OH in one position. But the sugar alcohol, glucotol, has it in both positions. Okay, so therein lies what we've done, is you've basically added an alcohol group to both ends. Okay, so now instead of there just being an alcohol group on one end, there is an alcohol group on both ends. Okay, we're going to go back into presentation mode now, I hope. Okay. Woo. Yeah. All right. So um, how do you consume sugar alcohols? Well, things like mannitol and glucotol and xylitol. These are what are used to um, sweeten sugarless gums. All right. So we use sugar alcohols when we have sugarless gums. So you are technically consuming sugar in a sugarless gum. It's just a sugar alcohol. So your body's going to process it differently. All right. What about deoxy sugars? Do, do, do. You should know what a deoxy sugar is, right? Because you've taken biology before, I assume. So deoxy sugars are monosaccharides with one or more hydroxyl groups replaced by hydrogens. Okay. So two, we look down here at the bottom right, two deoxy alpha because the hydroxide is pointed down, D-ribose, 2-deoxy saying that D, so no oxygen, so no OH group, so you've replaced the OH group here with a hydrogen, okay? And you can do some weird stuff too, like you could replace with a methyl group instead of a single hydrogen. So, but basically it's taking a sugar and getting rid of an OH group, so getting rid of um, a hydroxyl group and replacing it with something else. So this is the actual part of DNA. So it should look very familiar to you. This right here is a component of bark, tree bark. And this is actually found in some cell walls. Again, what this does is it decreases the polarity of this. And in a cell wall, that's not necessarily a bad thing to have a decrease in polarity. All right, what about sugar esters? So sugar esters are phosphate esters of glucose, fructose, and other monosaccharides. And so the word ester here can be a little misnomer, right? Because up until this point, when we've talked about esters, we've talked about primarily like methyl esters, where you replace the hydrogen on the oxygen with a methyl group. But it doesn't have to be a methyl ester. In this case, it's a phosphoester. So you are taking a phosphate group and you are replacing the hydrogens with a phosphate group. Again, what are you doing here? You're increasing the polarity. You're increasing the acidity of this molecule. And you know a sugar ester that is incredibly important to you, right? So uh, how about ATP, right? That's a sugar ester, okay? And you've had multiple phosphorylations, right? So these sugar esters are very important, and I just want to clarify again, when you hear the word ester, that doesn't mean it has to be a methyl group. All it means is that you have a hydrogen that has been replaced by something else. In this case, it's a phosphate group, all right? All right. And we're running out of time, so this is going to be the end of this video. We will end with sugar esters. We will pick up with just a little bit more in the next video. The next video will be really, really short, guys, okay? All right, so Stover out. See you in the last video.